Hello, good afternoon, everybody. Um, it's, um, I'm Katie Edwards. I'm the Graduate Recruitment and Development Manager at Gibson Dunn. It's an absolute pleasure to, to be here today and to, 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 to see you all. Thank you to our host, The Lawyer Portal, and to Rachel for, uh, for having us. So this afternoon, what have we got in store for you? Well, I'm gonna spend a few minutes talking to you, I guess, introducing myself, introducing the firm and our training program. And then I'm gonna hand over to our, um, our panel of trainees. Um, so we've got Harriet, Hannah, Freddie, and Sarah here with me today. They're gonna to talk a little bit about their, um, their training contract so far. So the groups that they've, that they've worked in um, and the, the type of work that they're involved with on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, we, I think the most valuable part of these type of webinars is, um, is the Q&A. Um, so what I don't propose that we're going to talk for, for the whole time today. We're going to, to spend a few minutes each um, and then we're going to kind of move to questions. So please do drop your questions into the chat. We're also joined here by um, Rowena, who's our senior recruiting coordinator. We work together. Um, Rowena is going to kindly keep an eye um, on the chat questions and answer throughout the webinar um, and will field any of those questions to us and, um, and, um, and as we go. So, so let's get started. So I have worked at Gibson Dunn for 10 years now and it kind of astounds me that the years have flown by. Um, I'm an employment lawyer by training, um, but I moved across to take over and establish the training program right before our, you know, our very first four trainees started back in 2015. So um, the training program has evolved, it's grown, um, and we just welcomed our, um, it must be our seventh intake of trainees, um, no, sorry, fifth intake of seven trainees, of which Freddie and Sarah are part of that group. Um, earlier this year, we've had our eighth vacation scheme and now four sets of um, trainees have, have qualified um, under mine and Rowena's care. So um, we, uh, we're certainly not a new programme by any stretch of the imagination, um, albeit we're still relatively young, I guess, by some standards. Um, I also sit on our firm's diversity, talent and inclusion committee, um, and I've done that for a number of years now. I take the lead on our social mobility initiatives for London, as well as our family group. Um, so if you have any questions in, in, that, in that realm as well, happy to answer those um, in the Q&A later today. So the firm, um, Gibson Dunn, what kind of firm are we? We are an international full service law firm um, with our roots in the US. We are a, a West Coast U US firm and many um, kind of publications comment on the fact that, that that contributes to our kind of laid back culture. I think, um, you know, California surface style rather than um, New York Wall Street style. And um, whilst, you know, I do actually think there's an element of truth to that in terms of the way we operate. Um, we've got more than 1,400 lawyers in, in 20 um, offices across the globe, so in, in kind of core business centers across the, across the world. Um, 10 of our offices are in the US and 10 are outside. So of course, London is, is one of those. So why do clients come to Gibson Dunn? Um, you know, what type of work are we involved with? Well, they, they come to us with their, their, their top end, so their complex cross-border matters. So when the reputational and the financial risks are at their highest, um, clients will turn to Gibson Dunn. Um, and the, the reason being, you know, there's often no precedent in the, you know, for the type of work that they'll turn to Gibson Dunn for. And that, that means that they need their lawyers to be, um, to be um, to, to think innovatively, and that's really what I think makes the work so um, phenomenally interesting. And hopefully, the trainees can can actually give you a little bit more, you know, bring that to life a bit when when you um, hear from them. So our London office is broadly split, split into two umbrellas. So we have the transactional practice, and we have the the disputes practice. And on the dispute side, we have um, international arbitration. We have commercial litigation and we have um, white collar investigations and um, some of our trainees will be able to talk to you about the type of work um, that, that you do in those teams. On the transactional side, there's a whole um, range of different teams. There's a corporate team, um, um, energy, there's capital markets, finance and restructuring. We also have employment teams and antitrust teams and they kind of straddle both disputes and transactional um, departments. Um, we actually have trainees, um, training opportunities in most of those teams, um, and that's actually something that's really quite important for you to think about when you're when you're thinking about what type of firm shall I um, shall I complete my training in? Because um, a firm like Gibson Dunn, we have broadly a 50-50 split in the you know 
that you know are lawyers who are working in either transactional work or disputes work. Um, and that means that you can get quite a broad experience in terms of the training, you know, before, if you don't quite know what type of lawyer you want to be yet, and you want to experience lots of different areas, it's really important to go to a firm, I think, where you can get that opportunity. Whereas if you're after a US firm, and perhaps you are, if you're here today kind of hearing from us, some of the US firms, but not all, um, tend to have a little bit more of a leaning to disputes or you know, perhaps private equity. So it's just something to think about. Um, what makes us different? Well, I just wanted to kind of draw to your attention um, a few key elements about the firm and about our training contract that I think kind of set us apart. So we have um, what's known as a low leverage model. So that, you know, some of you may be familiar with this, but that describes essentially how many partners you have um, per associate or um, per kind of junior lawyer. Ours is very low, so it's two to one. And, and the reason that that's very important for you is because that means that, um, particularly with a small cohort as well, you're gonna get a huge amount of partner time, of, um, of client time, and you'll get access to the really interesting aspects of the work um, straight from, from, from the, from the get-go, really. You've got a seat at the table, even as a you know, first seat training. Um, so I think that's very important. Um, it's something to really think about when you're looking at the type of firm that you're, you know, you want to apply to. We also have what's known as a free market system. And um, you might have read a little bit about it already, but essentially it's a system that empowers associates to kind of seek out the work that they want to be involved with. So to, because, I mean, you know, it's quite, you know, the theory is, and I think it makes complete sense, is that if you're working on matters that you're, you're really interested in, and if you've got control over charting your career, of course, you're going to be a much happier lawyer, um, and it, it just makes complete sense. So, um, and the, the spirit of the um, free market system is very much respected within the, the training program as well. Um, pro bono, um, I won't talk too much about pro bono, because I'm sure we're going to be able to do that um, in the Q&A, but um, we have a phenomenal pro bono practice um, and one of the key points about it is we get one for one credit so every hour that you spend working on pro bono work is treated in exactly the same way as it would if um, a billable hour so our pro bono clients are treated in exactly the same way as, as, our, as our fee paying clients as they should be but um, we could talk a little more about some of the very high profile matters that we've um, worked on um, when we move into the Q&A and, and, um, and I'm sure the trainers will have some have some ideas to talk to you about as well. Um, and fourthly, I just wanted to mention just that we're truly international. Obviously, I've said that we've got the 20 offices worldwide, but the, the matters are staffed with associates and trainees from, from various different offices um, across the world. Um, and what that means is, you know, right from, you know, you might start your day um, working on a matter in, in Hong Kong, and you might finish your day working on something in LA. Um, so if you're interested in international work, then, then this is, this is um, the firm for you. So I hope that gives you a, a bit of a, a kind of snapshot of what Gibson Dunn is about. Um, and I'm now going to hand over to Harriet, um, who will talk to you a little bit about her experience to date. Thank you, Harriet. Hi, everyone. Thanks, Katie. Um, my name's Harriet. Uh, I am a second year trainee. I'm in my third seat at Gibson Dunn, so I've been here for just over a year now. Um, I'm currently sat in disputes, so that involves international litigation and arbitration. Um, and Katie mentioned the free market system earlier, and I've, I'm kind of testament to that because I've sought out um, human rights work as well, which I've been heavily involved in during this seat. Um, my previous seats were in corporate and then employment and data protection. Um, which were both really interesting, but I thought I would talk to you today about a recent example that came up um, in some of my litigation work. It's quite interesting um, from the point of view that it spans both litigation and arbitration um, and is kind of quite characteristic of the type of work that I'm doing at the moment. Um, so the matter involved our client who went to an arbitration tribunal in Paris um, and won an award for hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars. Um, however, the defendants, that was back in 2017, however, the defendants have evaded paying that award um, for the past few years, which is obviously not ideal for our client. Um, so our client wanted to bring a claim to enforce that award in the English courts. Um, however, firstly, we wanted to 
freeze the defendant's assets in this jurisdiction, um, in this country, which means that you basically seek a court order which stops the defendant from transferring any of their money or assets out of the jurisdiction um, or spending it or hiding it offshore, which is what they tend to do when they know that they owe a massive sum of money to somebody. Um, freezing injunctions are really interesting because they tend to be heard without notice, um, which means that the defendant doesn't actually find out about the injunction until after it's been made, um, which means that they don't have a chance to defend it. And it also means that they don't have a chance to transfer their assets out of the country or hide them in the Cayman Islands or something similar. Um, so freezing injunctions tend to progress really quickly, which means they're really exciting to work on because obviously the courts um, need to uh, act really, we need to act really quickly to convince the court that this freezing injunction is necessary. And then the court needs to hear the case really quickly so that they can grant the award and stop the defendant from uh, spending all their money. Um, so another factor that makes them pretty interesting is that we have to find out whether the defendant actually has any assets in this country. Um, so that involves you know, employing private investigators and looking into people's finances, which can be pretty interesting. Um, and obviously the injunction can be granted over money, so bank accounts and things like that, but it can also be granted over shares, um, sometimes houses or even cars, so Ferraris and Bentleys and things like that. So yeah, they're pretty fun to work on, quite colourful cases. Um, and that was one of my first experiences in this seat, which I thought was just really interesting. Um, in terms of why Gibson Dunn stood out for me, I was really interested in doing a lot of pro bono work alongside all my billable work. Um, and as Katie mentioned, some pro bono is something that the firm prides itself on. And it also recognises this in the fact that each billable, each pro bono hour counts as a billable hour. So that's really important for our own credits. Um, but also, I think it just goes to show how important um, pro bono is to the firm. I think as well, you know, the firm has really, really amazing opportunities and pro bono clients. Um, I'll mention a few in a, in a short while, but also I think it's worth considering um, that pro bono adds quite a variety to your workload because the type of work that you do is quite different to um, the kind of more corporate or disputes work. Um, and it allows you to work across different departments and different teams. Um, so, you know, a matter might span lots of different aspects of law, for example, tax, corporate employment, um, and it allows you to work with different partners, different associates and different trainees um, to really kind of get the most out of, out of the matter and also for your own professional development um, as well. So just to name a few that I've worked on, I'm, I'm sure many of you uh, have heard of Unseen. They're a big modern slavery charity in this country and they're basically fighting for modern slavery laws to be um, abolished, uh, not abolished, sorry, <laughs> strengthened um, and modern slavery in this country to be abolished. And, you know, that's quite important at the moment given the Boohoo scandal and various other um, high profile cases that have been in the media recently relating to potential allegations of modern slavery. Um, I also work for a charity called First Star who work with adopted and foster children. Um, First Star are a charity that set up university academies um, which help adopted and foster children get into universities and assist them with like general life skills, um, UCAS exams and things like that. Um, so we help them with corporate and employment work and we also attend board meetings twice a year which is really nice. Um, I'm also in charge of the domestic violence clinic at Gibson Dunn, which involves providing legal advice to people with um, domestic violence questions. So at the moment, we would usually do that in person, but at the moment we're doing that over the phone. Um, and we've helped many, many hundreds of different people um, obtain court orders or even just provide a roof over their heads for a night. So. Yeah, there's plenty of opportunity to get involved with lots of really interesting pro bono work at Gibson Dunn. Um, and if anyone has any questions, I'll be happy to answer them later in the Q&A. Thank you. Thanks, Harriet. Um, Hannah, are you next up, please? 
Well, thanks, Katie. Thanks, Harriet. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Hannah. I'm also a second year trainee um, in my third seat, um, like Harriet. Um, I currently sat in employment, um, but my first two seats were in corporate and um, then in arbitration. Um, and, you know, as Katie and Harriet have sort of mentioned, both of those previous seats involved a real breadth of work. So although my first seat was in corporate, um, my supervisor was predominantly focused around sort of energy M&A work. So I worked in um, on a lot of matters and in a lot of sort of business development um, type work streams to do with um, the energy sphere, which was really, really cool. Um, but I also worked across the whole breadth of our corporate practice. So on private equity matters, on public, um, public listing matters and a bit of finance and a bit of tax as well. Um, and similarly, in my dispute seat, whilst I was sort of heavily focused around international arbitration, I um, did lots of different interesting bits of litigation pieces as well. So um, yeah, now, now I'm in employment, um, but I'll just talk to you very briefly about my sort of background and sort of entry into the firm initially. Um, so I read history at Bristol um, so I came from a very much a, a non-law background um, and loved my degree, um, could have studied it forever, but always sort of knew that professionally um, I was interested in a career in commercial law. Um, and I did the, um, applied to the Gibson Dunn Vacation Scheme back in gosh, 2016. I did the vacation scheme um, in, my, in the summer after my final year of studying um, and just sort of fell in love with the firm, felt like I fitted in. Um, and was obviously very lucky enough to be offered a training contract off the back of that. Um, so I'm also very flexible in that I took a year out after my degree to um, work abroad before completing the, um, the GDL and the LPC. So um, had a nice had a nice break before that. Um, so I just sort of wanted to mention that I think there's definitely not a disadvantage to studying um, a non-law subject before. Um, entering commercial or generally, but specifically Gibson Dunn, I think we've got a real breadth and variety of backgrounds in our trainee cohort, lots of different academic disciplines. Um, and I actually found that sort of studying a non-law subject really helped to um, hone my interview technique. Um, if, you're, if you love what you study, then you're always sort of better equipped, I think, to talk about it in a passionate way. Um, so don't ever be disheartened if you've sort of not come from a law a law background or kind of new new to the area. Um, you can definitely use your points of difference to your advantage. And in terms of the work I've sort of been involved in over my last over this seat and my previous seat. So as I mentioned, my current seat is um, in employment, um, and we've got quite a small, um, quite sort of focused employment team. But we work across a huge range of matters and across all sort of types of employment work. Um, so at the moment I'm working on a really big investigation, but I'm also involved in other pieces of work across the whole range of um, the areas that we sort of have expertise in. So that includes working in data protection matters, doing employment aspects to a transaction, a big corporate M&A transaction, um, as well as all sorts of different advisory um, type client work. Um, and a good example of, as Katie, as Katie spoke about earlier, the expo exposure you get as a junior um, at, at Gibson and as a trainee to international matters is, is the investigation I'm currently working on. So it's for a um, really large household name, a big corporate that you, you would all know. Um, and it's to do with a very difficult, tricky employee who sort of eventually left this company by settlement and after many um, grievances and issues in the company and we're conducting a sort of large-scale investigation looking back on what happened and trying to advise the client how they can avoid a similar situation happening again um, and, and on that matter is um, myself one London associate and one London um, partner one DC associate and one New York and one um, LA partner so a really small team of six across a number of our different offices um, and I've got to work sort of one-on-one -on -one with um, the different partners, sort of organizing interviews, conducting interviews via Zoom for the investigation. Um, so that's been a really great, great experience. And in my previous seat in um, disputes, I, as I mentioned, was sort of um, really um, sort of thrown into the world of arbitration and Gibson Dunn is quite um, famous in the sort of arbitration um, 
world, I would say, for our expertise. We're very well known. Um, and one thing that we um, are very, very good at is that we work on both sort of commercial arbitration. So, for example, I worked in arbitrations that involved sort of two major commercial oil and gas companies. But as well as working on commercial um, arbitrations, we also work in the investor state arbitration sphere. So that means that in, the, in those disputes, there is both a commercial entity um, who's usually invested in, um, in a nation state and the dispute is, is against the government. So I've been lucky enough to be involved in arbitrations, both um, in sort of just pure commercial terms, but also when we've been acting against the government. So that's been um, sort of really eye-opening and again, another example of the sort of breadth and variety that you get at Gibson. Um, in fact, on one of the arbitrations I worked in, sort of right in the midst of lockdown, we had a, um, a big hearing and I was lucky enough, to, well, lucky enough in some in some regards, but also put, put a bit under pressure to um, conduct the the um, hearing on, on Zoom. So I was the host of the Zoom. All of the different um, sides were running PowerPoint presentations and I was sort of the one juggling, juggling all the presentation clicking the slides through, sort of had to be very reactive. Um, my internet did did crash at one point, which was um, unfortunate, but managed to get through it. So it was it was a really sort of um, fast paced and interesting day. And yeah, that's an, you know another really good example of, I think the sorts of things that you wouldn't necessarily get to do at, at other types of firms as a trainee. Um, so yeah, please um, ask me any questions in the Q&A um, if Benny's coming to mind. Thanks very much. Thanks, Hannah, that was great. Um, okay, Freddie, um, over to you, please. Hi, everyone, I'm Freddie. I'm a first year trainee, currently sat in corporate real estate. And as a first year, I wanted to talk about my experience of starting the training contract during the coronavirus pandemic. So specifically, I started in September when the restrictions were considerably more relaxed. As a result, I was in the office for the first week of training. This meant I got to start the training contract in person together with, uh, with the other trainees in my intake. And I'm really grateful to have started in the office. However, since the restrictions have tightened, I have largely worked from home. And as a result, I have not met my team in person yet. But nonetheless, the team have been really welcoming and supportive. We have regular real estate team meetings, which have helped integrate me into the team. And there are also plans for a virtual holiday drinks at the end of the year. More generally, the firm has been very supportive. We have weekly, Zoom, uh, weekly Zooms with the graduate recruitment team. The firm has organized for equipment to be sent home. And we have a budget to spend on office equipment and furniture. So overall, I don't feel that lockdown has really held back my training contract. And in terms of work, I'm currently based in real estate. The real estate department is a really interesting seat to sit in as I get to do a wide variety of work. I have helped on corporate transactions involving real estate assets. In other words, the purchase of companies that own buildings. And I've also helped on pure real estate transactions in other words, the purchase of the buildings themselves. And I think it is a real advantage to have such a wide range of experience in my first seat. I've also liked the high levels of responsibility and the small size of the teams. I worked on a deal that closed last week. And on this deal, the Gibson Dunn team comprised of me and one associate. This meant I had a significant direct role in ensuring the transaction went smoothly. It also meant I got to coordinate with local council and liaise with the other side's lawyers. As a result, I got the opportunity to learn a lot of different skills in a very short space of time. And I think it's a very good example of the benefits of Gibson Dunn's low leverage model. Um, and I'm happy to talk about this or anything else in the Q&A at the end. Thank you. Thank you, Freddie. Sorry, I was on mute, everyone. Um, Sarah there, please. 
Uh, hi everyone, my name is Sarah. I'm also a first year trainee. I'm currently sitting in my first seat in the corporate department, kind of doing private mergers and acquisitions and private equity with a bit of a, an energy slant to it. So very varied and I've already worked on several different matters with the different clients kind of across the corporate sphere. Um, the thing that I wanted to talk to you about this afternoon was my route into law, which was slightly unconventional. So I studied politics at university. And when I graduated, I went and did the local government graduate scheme, which is like the civil service, but not as well paid. Um, and I did that for two years in a variety of roles until I realized that actually it wasn't the career for me and that I wanted to make a career change into corporate law. So I started attending open days and actually Gibson Dunn was one of the first open days that a law firm I attended. And I was really impressed that you know, they scheduled a whole day for us. There were loads of different talks um, and activities, including with some of the partners, which I thought was great considering how busy they are, that they would take time out of their day to do that with us. Um, and also how friendly everyone was and how welcoming everyone seemed to be. Um, so after doing that, I applied for the vacation scheme at Gibson Dunn. Our vacation scheme runs in the summer and it's a relatively long one because it lasts for three weeks, which is great because it gives you a chance to really get inside the firm and really understand the culture. Um, while I was doing it, I sat half in the corporate department uh, and half of it in the litigation department. So I got a good range of you know, the work that the firm does on both sides of the business. While I was here, I did a variety of interesting work for my supervisors. We did some assess tasks that were actually quite fun, like a mock negotiation actually was, was really good. Um, and also a good mix of socials so you could get to know the other vacation scheme students, the trainees, the lawyers and the other staff that make up the London office. Uh, and it was the vacation scheme that really secured to me why I wanted to be at Gibson Dunn. Um, you know, it showed me the fact that they had a small trainee intake who were obviously, you know, good friends and, and close. And, and I, you know, I felt that you would get more exposure to the partners because there weren't as many of you. Um, I was impressed by the international nature of the work, but even on the vacation scheme, I could already see like how we would work with other offices. And, and that's, only that's only continued on as I actually started doing work as a trainee. Um, and I also was attracted, as Katie mentioned, by the low leverage model. So the idea that you would work more directly with the senior associates and the partners. Um, and luckily I got off the training contract. So <laughs> um, yes, but I'm happy to talk about anything like that during the Q&A. Thank you. Okay, um, that's great, Sarah. Thank you very much. Um, what I'm going to do, um, please do, um, I'm, you know, I'm conscious that we want to make sure that the Q&A is as relevant as possible to, um, to those of you that are listening and that we answer you know, the, the types of questions that are relevant to you. Um, but what I'm going to first um, kind of turn to are, are the frequent asked questions so the types of questions that we get asked a lot um, at law fairs etc and some questions that have already come up this year um, so you know I, I guess um, one of the things that comes up in, in some ways I'm kind of answering this myself is you know what um, what type of trainees do we look for you know what what characteristics do do we look for um, in trainees and um, there are four elements that we that we look for um, that we've kind of distilled it down in terms of characteristics we look for um, sociability entrepreneurial spirit maturity and intellectual curiosity and what does that actually mean in practice um, and, and please do if any of you have any any trainees if you have any um, comments that you want to add to this in your experience but um, in terms of sociability, it's it's absolutely imperative that you know when you're working in a busy commercial law firm and you know whatever firm you go to, whether it is Gibson Dunn or um, you know any other commercial outfit, you're you know it, it is it is it is demanding. It's a demanding role, um, and you will you know you're you're working in teams, and you have to be a team player. You need to be someone who's who's respectful, who's humble, who kind of relates well to to peers. Um, and to you know to clients as well and so so we we really look for that element um in people in terms of the maturity that's again something i mean sarah's talked about you know being a career changer and i think so it whether you come straight out of um university at undergraduate level or whether you you do come to our training contract a few years on and and i don't you know i actually think that's quite a good thing that we've had a few people that have either you know done gone on and done you know further study further postgraduate study or they've started an entirely different industry and moved across it's not something that we look negatively on we actually see it as a as a really positive string to, to someone's bow um but yeah it's it's having that maturity because that self-confidence in yourself um 
to, um, I guess, to handle, um, you know, juggling lots of different matters, um, you know, spinning lots of plates, you know, you have to be adaptable, you have to be emotionally engaged. Um, and that's the, th those are the types of skills that we kind of look for under the heading of maturity. Um, intellectual curiosity, I mean, that's something that I guess um, is, is, is very important. You know, you have to be, I talked about being a, you know, innovative and being a creative thinker, but the type of work that we do, you know, you have to be able to sit back and try, you know, and, and use your abilities. Um, you know, it, it's not so much about, you know, it's a, a lots of um, law firms, and this is not a negative, it's just, it's just whether this suits you or not, but at, at some law firms you will train and you'll very much become, I guess, you know, an employment lawyer and you will, you will just entirely remain in that section. You won't kind of move, you know, into other areas, so like data protection or, um, it, but whereas it, at Gibson Dunn, you have to, you know, you have to think of yourself as, you know, as capable of picking up any matter and having the academic ability and all the other skills that you need to just, to just get on and, and come up with the, a creative idea and a creative response for your client. And that kind of, that kind of way of thinking, that good judgment, that um, kind of seeing the bigger picture, that's what we're looking for in terms of intellectual curiosity. Um, what entrepreneurial spirit, yes, okay, that goes to the heart of, um, of our free market system. So if you are someone who is, you know, you love a challenge, and I don't mean like a physical challenge, but I mean, you know, you, but you, you are, you're energetic in, in the way that you think um, and you, you know, you, you want to, um, you know, you're hardworking, you've got leadership skills, you know, in a small cohort, you know, you need to be someone that's, that's confident enough in, in you, your ability to go out and seek out this new work, to seek out, um, you know, partners that you want to work with or senior associates and feel entirely comfortable doing that. Um, and if that sounds like you, that's very much that, you know, those skills are, you know, if you have those, that's the type of person that will really flourish at Gibson Dunn. But I don't know if any of you have anything, you know, to add to that, um, that you've kind of seen in your experience or anything that you thought was, um, you know, in your experience at Gibson Dunn so far. Don't worry if you don't, we'll move on to the next question. So, um, okay, so what, um, you know, what about, we always get this, got asked this question, can you describe um, the culture of the firm? I mean, does anybody want to, to take that one? You know, in your experience, what, what is Gibson Dunn's culture? I think from my experience, um, everyone is really, really friendly, but also really, really hardworking. And I think it's the type of firm where, you know, not only, for example, if we have to work late one night on a big deal signing or a big court filing, it's not only the trainees that are staying up late, it's also the junior associates, it's also the senior associates, and it's also often the partners who are there um, staying up late and getting the work done together. So there's that there's that really kind of hardworking, but also collaborative um, team effort that kind of permeates throughout the firm, and I think exemplifies the culture of the firm. Yeah, I I I, uh, I agree, um, Harriet. I mean, I the one thing I always kind of think is important to think about with culture is it's very much so a law firm's culture is very much a, um, an outcome of the way it's organised and its systems because systems drive culture and they drive people's behaviour. So, and one thing that's that's important to kind of add about Gibson Dunn and kind of emphasise is, so because of, because we are set up as one firm and we're not, you know, associates aren't kind of set and, and almost owned, for want of a better word, by a particular department, then that, that makes um, it a very, an environment in which you can work on lots of different matters there are no restrictions on doing that so, so by way of example if a matter comes in to um, a partner in say our new york office you know the new york office is not one it doesn't have one profit you know account of its own it's, it's a whole global profit account so a, a partner is not in it you know going to be influenced um, you know because even the nicest people in the world are slightly influenced by by these things so if you if you he, he will he or she will, will want to get the best associates involved in that matter not just the associates within their team so you you know they would look to um 
to associates potentially in London to be staffed on that matter. And it, it just, it, that is very key and really goes to the heart of culture, I think. Um, so, I mean, from my perspective, I find, you know, the culture to be, you know, supportive. I've talked about being entrepreneurial, um, inspiring. I think, you know, I constantly astounded and inspired by the, the lawyers that we're working with on a day-to-day -day basis um, and positive. I think for me, you, you are, it, it's a very can-do um, attitude in, in, in the way it approaches matters, the firm, the firm. But yeah, does anybody else have anything that they want to add on culture? Just a, a quick point, which is very related, mm -hmm. Katie, to what you said and actually to what Harriet said too. I think another thing worth worth mentioning is because of um, the kind of low leverage model, the environment is very sort of open door in that there's um, a very sort of in, informal to some extent relationship that you can have with very senior um, associates and partners by um, just by virtue of there being, you know, very working in very small teams, you have a, a much more direct access to those senior lawyers and can work sort of more closely with them, which gives you obviously better learning opportunities from, from senior people, but also um, fosters a nice sort of environment where you don't feel sort of scared or intimidated by senior, senior um, lawyers and you can work directly with them. Um, so that I think really helps to um, foster that sort of really open and friendly environment that we were talking about. Yeah. Thanks, Hannah. I mean, what about the, um, you know, we often get questions because there'll sometimes be a bit of a misconception that the training at a US firm is, um, you know, is, is different and perhaps, you know, some people might say is, you know, is inferior to some training that you might get at, at other, um, other law firms. Um, what, do you have any kind of comments on that? I mean, what training have you uh, received to date um, in your seats? I think I would challenge the idea that we get a worse or notably different uh, training experience to peer firms. I've got lots of friends that work at other firms and having spoken to them, I feel like I'm getting a fairly similar training experience to them. Um, and then in terms of what we have in terms of training, I'm sat in corporate and then uh, um, we have approximately one or two training sessions every week where the corporate trainees um, are taught by a partner or a senior associate on specific aspects of corporate transactions. So I feel like we're constantly being taught and being supported um, throughout our training contract. And additionally to that, because of the low leverage model, because we have small teams, the associates are more willing to reach out and help you and go through parts of a transaction, in my experience, that I might not understand because I'm in a small team, they need me to be up to speed. So they want to really help me and help um, sh make, help ensure that I have the training I need. Yeah. Thanks, Freddie. Um, I, I've got a few more frequently asked questions, but I've got some questions that come in on the yeah, chat. So let's got, yeah, we've got a couple of questions here. Um, so we've got a question about um, whether there's kind of a, a sense of pressure and competition because of the free market system. Mm. How do you guys find that? Um, I'm quite happy, happy to answer that question. Um, I think by virtue of the fact that the trainee intake is quite small and by virtue of the fact that Gibson Dunn has a lot of work, I personally have never found that a matter that I want to work on and have reached out to a partner about has also been already staffed with another trainee on it or another trainee has reached out and asked for that work as well. Um, even if that were to be the case, I think that there would always be a way that two trainees could work on a matter or even three trainees. And I, I know that's happened in the past with various, in particular, pro bono initiatives that have come in. Um, I also think by virtue of the fact that the kind of, as we just spoke about, the culture is so open and friendly. I just think that competitive spirit amongst trainees or amongst associates and trainees or anything like that, that just doesn't happen at the firm. Um, I've never experienced anything like that. And I think, you know, I'm really good friends with everyone in my intake and everyone in the intake below. Um, and if someone was already working on something, I'd probably reach out to them separately and say, do you think there's scope for me to get involved? I'm interested. Yeah. Um, so that, that kind of goes to the open and friendly culture. Um, but no, I don't think there's pressure or competition 
uh, that is driven by the free market system. Thanks, Harriet. Yeah, to add to that, that, it was something that was really important to me when I was looking for which firms to apply to was that there was a sense of camaraderie between the trainees and a sense of working together. Um, and so far at Gibson Dunn, that has been the experience. You know, you might think that there's seven of us and we're all kind of competing to be the best trainee, but it really doesn't feel like that. And actually, it feels like we're kind of one team. And, you know, when, you know, last weekend, one of my colleagues was really busy, so I helped her out and then... The other night I got unexpectedly busy and one of my colleagues took and one of the other trainees just took a load of work from me and got it done because he knew I was busy. And I really, and you know, he could have just, he didn't have to do that. He stayed behind late to do that for me. And it just really kind of shows you how we're, you know, we're not competing with each other. We're kind of working together. Thanks, Sarah. Katie, we've got a question here. Um, I think probably best for you. Um, what type of universities have our trainees come from? Um, Russell Group, non-Russell Group? No, that's a, that's a very good question. Um, we, we accept applications from all universities. So we accept you know, Russell Group and non-Russell Group. We have a small cohort of trainees, but I just checked this morning. And for example, in the last intake that we've just, you know, um, we've just kind of made offers to, there was, you know, seven trainees and six different universities. They were all Russell Group universities in that, you know, in that section, but we, um, we, we try to be as diverse as possible in terms of the, the universities that we are recruiting from. Um, and we make a huge amount of efforts to do that, uh, particularly, um, I mean, I've seen another question that's, that's come in um, from Rachel about, you know, you know, are there efforts that have been, you know, been made to make law firms diverse? Yes. It's a really important question. It's a huge um, focus of Gibson Dunn, um, and it's a huge focus of me and Rowena. Um, we we care deeply about making our um, our trainee intake as diverse as possible, and 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 also about the London office itself and the and the firm more more widely. The, I mean, just to give you a little bit of information, there's our, we we you know the firm itself um, has it runs a two tier. Um, diversity system. So there's a global diversity uh, committee, which is committed um, to rolling out our strategic efforts. And we have um, some me members of our management committee, of our executive committee sit at the, on, um, on that global committee so that there is, you know, the, the message is very much from the top. Then we have local diversity committees that um, are focused on rolling out those initiatives and ensuring that they are um, effective at local level. So um, that's the committee that I sit on. We, um, it's a very active committee. We've been um, running now for almost 12 years. We have seven subgroups. Um, so we focus on um, gender, on access and social mobility. And we can, you know, Rowena and I, um, Rowena actually takes the lead on our prime work experience program, which we're very proud of. Um, we have 12 candidates that join us every year. We have an LGBT plus group, um, a multicultural forum, um, a disability group, and a, um, a wellness group actually as well. So there is, um, and we have, I mean, a, a whole list of, of initiatives that we run on an annual basis, but we're, we're committed both at the recruitment level, um, as well as, you know, to, to ensure that we're recruiting a diverse um, group of people at the retainment level, so that we're retain that we're creating an inclusive environment and that we're, we're, we're an environment that people want to remain in. But, you know, as important, if not, you know, the most important thing is that people are developing and they're being promoted. Um, and, you know, there are, um, we've still got a, a huge way to go, um, like a lot of firms, but it's um, it, it's a genuine and 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 an ongoing committed effort there. So hopefully that answers your question. I could talk about that for a very very long time, but I can see that there are a lot of other questions coming in. Um, yeah. Any that you would like to draw out, Ro? Katie, there's a couple along the same lines. Um, so any specific advice we can give for VAC scheme applications? Um, how can candidates best prepare for the process? Um, yeah. that kind of thing. Yeah, I mean, I would, I'd be interested, interested to hear from um, any of you guys in the training group about preparing for the interview process. Do you have any tips? I mean, maybe I'll just give you a little bit of a, of an overview of what that process is. So we have, and I think I saw a, you know, a, a question about you know, our, our opportunities. So we've got an upcoming opening day. So um, 
that is in December. So, and, and the, the it's still the applications are still open, and we still have places available. So, I would highly recommend people looking at applying to our open day because it's a full day. I think Sarah was the one who mentioned it before, and it's it's just um, a, a, a brilliant opportunity to to hear more about what we're about. And that day, if you you know by the end of that day, you'll know whether this is, you know, we're the right type of firm for you to apply for and whether you want to apply for our vacation scheme. And it will inform your vacation scheme application so much because you, you can just pick up so much from, from a day of meeting. Um, it's jam packed, <laughs> you, you'll be tired by the end of it. But um, yeah, so that our vacation scheme applications are open until the 1st of February. Um, but in terms of um, the, the process, it's um, it's actually quite a simple process, and I, we've done that on purpose. I don't feel the need um, of making people jump through hoops. I don't have any psychometric testing. What I want to do is, you know, you fill in the form online. It's apply for law, so all hires. So you fill in your academics, provide us a little bit of information about your um, work experience, and then it's just one cover letter. And that kind of the freestyle of the cover letter allows you to kind of just tell us what you want to tell us about you um, and don't be afraid to just be yourself I think authenticity really shines through in an application and and it, you know it will absolutely be important to be authentic once you get to um, the interview stage but on the basis of that application and um, also just tell us about your hobbies as well we get so many applications these days that are really very academic and but we really want to get to know you um, and I I I, I um that's what I want to achieve from the recruitment process. Um, it, it's not just about us in any way kind of grilling you. It's about you understanding what the firm's about and us learning about you. So the, once your application is in, Ro and I will review those and we, we review every single application. There's no, um, this is, so somebody did ask about grades as well. So you know, if your grades are below our kind of minimum requirements, we, we, we consider the application in the round and, and it, you know, if there are, maybe you have circumstances that meant you didn't get the grades you wanted or, or, or not, but we will still consider um, applications if your A-levels are below um, our, our minimum requirement. But what we would want to see is just kind of a bit of an upward trajectory in terms of how you've done later on in your degree. Um, so don't be kind of deterred from still putting in your application. But then we will then interview you at first stage um, and then we will put through candidates to second stage. And at that stage, that's where you would meet, um, generally speaking, a partner and associate um, and another partner and associate. The first stage of the interview is general motivations. Why Gibson Dunn? Why commercial law? And the second stage, you um, review a um, one of our, well, we choose a couple of news articles which we haven't chosen yet so we try and make them topical well they will be topical because <laughs> we haven't chosen them yet we make them um we try and ensure that they are not i you know too legal because many of you won't study law that they're not too political you know not everybody is sat around their dinner table discussing politics with their parents and and uh, and we're very conscious of of, of that um it, so we, we try and we try and find something that is um, accessible to, um, to to everyone, and that's important to us. So we you would then have half an hour to review those articles, and then you would go into the interview and discuss that. And again, even in that interview, it's not about your view on those articles. Although, of course, your view is is a relevant point. It's it's just that we want to see the way you where you articulate your view and the way you marshal your thoughts, because that's, that's what's important. And that's what, you know, the skills that we're looking for in terms of, you know, really um, natural lawyer, you'll be someone who can, can articulate your points in a, in a very clear and concise way. So um, I don't know if any of you guys have, want to comment on your experience of that process. Um, when you, if you can remember back to when you interviewed, I think for me, I actually really liked the Gibson Dunn process compared to some of the other firms I applied to because of the, the cover letter primarily. I felt that it really gave you a chance to kind of be yourself and also shape exactly what you wanted to say about your background. So obviously I came from local government. So on the surface of it, it doesn't seem like it translates very nicely to corporate law. But actually, because I had the kind of freedom in the cover letter, I could pull out like specific things from my job that I thought were relevant and really show why 
I wanted to make the change and why I thought I could make the change. It'd be a good reason. And then the interview, yeah, again, really, like it was really cool to meet the partners and something that Gibson Dunn did that some of the other firms I applied to didn't do as well was that they really asked me about my job. Um, and some of the other firms I applied to only asked me about university, which I found really strange because I was like, I left two years ago and I have been doing things since then, even, you know? So I was actually really impressed with the interest they took and, and how they kind of gave me that stage to really shape the interview and what I thought was relevant. Mm. Thanks, Sarah. Ron, are there any questions that you would want to pick out or I'm happy to? Yeah, we've got some questions I think might be um, for the trainees to answer. So we've got one about training. Um, in terms of training and development, is it more on the job training or more formalized classroom based training? I'd say it's a real mixture of both. As Freddie said, you get formal training um, on a weekly basis. But there's also obviously a lot of on the job training. Um, and I think that comes with the fact that you're given quite a lot of responsibility quite early on. Um, and that's related as well to the kind of low leverage model that we talked about earlier. It's also worth mentioning at this point that there's, <clears throat> sorry, <clears throat> there's a um, professional development budget that each, each trainee gets. Um, and we're allowed to spend that on whatever sort of training materials or webinars or you know, memberships to a particular industry body um, that we might find interesting and, and might assist us from a professional development um, point of view. So I think that's, that's another thing. And that's something that the firm um, does in a number of other different areas as well and, and links to the kind of entrepreneurialism that you're um, allowed to kind of grow at the firm. Thanks, Harriet. Um, we've got another qu uh, question for the trainees. What opportunities are there for trainees to get involved in business development? I can take that one. Um, really depends, but I, um, like everything at Gibson Dunn, you know, you sort of move with the business need of the firm. So during my first week, um, my supervisor was really, really um, focused on her sort of business development. Um, in her area of law, which was sort of energy M&A. So because of that, by virtue of that, by virtue of the, of the free market system and me wanting to be involved in that, I um, spent a great deal of time on sort of business development matters. So that's what that involved, lots of research into um, clients we might want to approach uh, and, and clients who we then maybe did approach and were presenting to or pitching to. Um, different um, research into existing clients and maintaining those relationships and kind of strengthening, strengthening them. Um, and generally as well, sort of on a daily basis, keeping abreast of um, the energy sector in general, what companies were doing, what the big news stories were to make sure that, and sort of filling in the rest of the team um, really frequently to make sure everyone sort of knew what was going on sort of around the world. Um, so yeah, absolutely. And Harriet, it's probably another very good person to talk about it, but trainees can definitely get really involved in pitches um, across departments. Um, I've certainly been involved in um, this sort of more on the disputes side as well. Um, lots of research opportunities there to kind of make sure that the senior lawyers are fully informed when they're going into meetings um, with clients. Yeah, so, and it's another thing like, like with pro bono that we were speaking about earlier that can really diversify your workload. Um, and give you sort of another insight into a different part of the firm. Thank you. Um, Katie, we've got a couple of questions that you can probably answer. Um, so we've got one about the next summer scheme and whether it will be virtual, what support is available for someone that maybe doesn't live in London, um, and also about the applications, how many we get, how competitive it is. Um, Yes, thank you. Both very good questions. The virtual, um, the, the vacation scheme in the summer, we're working on the basis it will be virtual. Um, and I do remember if we, we did a virtual scheme this summer and I'm incredibly proud of how it went um, because it, you know, it went so well. It was, um, and one of the things I'm particularly pleased about is that the virtual environment is, make, you know, is such an improvement in terms of the reach um, of people and you know it problems like um, you know being able to get to London um, you know just fall away when when you have a virtual vacation scheme so I am actually very um, much um, 
it, well, I'm very excited about the fact that the, the virtual vacation scheme will um, kind of continue this year, that some of our open days will remain virtual. And I think even when we return to normal, I am going to recommend that we have some open days in person, but that we keep some of the schemes open, uh, uh, keep some of the schemes virtual. The same for our um, some of our diversity initiatives. So our, our prime scheme, you know, that what whilst that was wonderful, it's it's actually only really accessible for, for students from London. Um, and so we've we've just um, started becoming involved in a prime project which kind of works with students. In, you know what are known as cold spots across the country so that um, you know where people don't have access to, to, to meaningful work experience because they work outside of London so um, I'm excited that one of the one of the only positive things surely that's come out of this you know awful pandemic is that we've seen that the virtual environment can work um, and then it can be just as, as beneficial for, for students. So um, I'm going to, to recommend a, a mixture of the two. So, yeah. Thank you. And um, there was one about um, kind of how competitive it is and how oh, many yes, applications yes, you get. So application wise, we normally um, receive about 500 to 600 um, applications for our summer vacation scheme. We, um, which is a fairly significant number, but we interview the top 10%. So, you know, 50 to 60 candidates, and then, you know, around about 18 of those will make it onto the vacation scheme. So it, it, the numbers, I guess, sound quite high, but um, it, there are certain things you really can do to make your application stand out. Even just coming along to this type of webinar, if you mention that on any application, um, if you've been to um, an open day, obviously mention that. If you've met us at any other law firm, um, sorry, law fair, then mention that because that will put your application above many, many, many others that we receive. Um, and you're already kind of pushing your, 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 yourself to the top of the pile. Thanks, Katie. I've got quite a question here actually for the trainees. Um, how much experience did you all have before working here? I guess we can all quickly just run through what we had. Um, I, I'd worked with a barrister for a week, uh, just shadowing him. And then I did a two week vacation scheme at a Magic Circle law firm and then the Gibson Dunn vacation scheme. Um, and I'd also done a week in a family law firm and decided that wasn't for me. Hannah, do you want to go? Sure, um, I'd also done one other vacation scheme but, and oh, I did one week of um, shadowing as well when I was about 15. But other than that, um, you know, no, no, very little legal work experience. But what I had had was lots of varied part time jobs, um, all sorts of things, tutoring, waitressing. Um, and I very much utilised sort of the drew, drew out experiences that I'd gained and skills that I gained from those experiences um, in my application. So I think, you know, yeah, as I sort of mentioned before about um, what, what makes you different and variety. Um, don't be disheartened if you perhaps don't have um, lots of legal work experience, if you've done lots of other interesting things. Like Hannah, I also didn't have that much legal work experience. I had a week shadowing a family law barrister where I decided that that wasn't for me. And then I had one week at an insight week at a city law firm. But beyond that, um, the, the first like proper legal work experience I had was the Gibbs and Dunn vacation scheme. But as Hannah's also touched on, I had a lot of experience elsewhere. I was, I was working as a teacher in France when I applied and I made sure I incorporated those skills into my application. And I think it just, by bringing in those, um, skills and experiences you've had that are um, from a non-law context really help your application as we've all discussed before because it just um, separates you from the other candidates and shows like a side, a side to you that um, is not necessarily um, as obvious um, if all you're focusing on is the law. Yeah um, I've done a handful of uh, open days and one other vacation scheme at a different US law firm before the Gibson Dunn vacation scheme. And I also managed a couple of months in my council's legal department before I left my job. Um, so not a huge amount of work, legal work experience. It's all about tailoring the experiences you have to the firm and why you think they're relevant. 
I've seen, um, thanks Sarah, um, an interesting question here about um, whether trainees can propose pro bono matters to work on. Um, I mean, I do any, have any of you had experience of that today? I mean, I was gonna just quickly mention that by way of example, um, you know, Ryan Whelan, I mean, he's an associate in our, in our um, London office, but many, you know, you might, those of you on, the, on this webinar might have read about Gina Martin's um, campaign, upskirting um, campaign. So, and it, it was a very high profile campaign that, that Ryan Whelan um, supported her on. And, you know, the, the result of which they were, um, so upskirting has been made a sexual offence in, in England and Wales and other kind of jurisdictions have followed suit after that. But it's, um, it, you know, Ryan, the first, it's just an example of, of, that was something that Ryan had pursued entirely by himself and, and that the firm entirely supported. So it's, um, I, and I think, you know, the, the same would be true of a trainee. I don't know if any of you have had an example of something that you've, you know, looked into yourself. Um, one of the trainees in our intake is looking into onboarding the prison, I think it's the Prison Reform Trust. Um, Hannah, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, and she's like pushing to have Gibson Dunn represent them. Um, so that's really interesting. There's definitely scope for trainees to bring on their own matters, be that pro bono or otherwise. Um, and the partners are very receptive and excited about that. Thank you. Um, we've got some other interesting questions here. So um, we've got a couple of questions here um, along the same lines. How much experience um, does someone need to have in kind of technological fields? So legal fields like increasing the use of AI and so on. Yeah. Um, have, you, have any of you had, ex you know, have you felt that you've had to have that experience to date? Sorry, what's the question? So how much experience would we need to have in regards to technology in the legal field, like increasing use of AI? I mean, we'd certainly have a growing AI practice um, and uh, which actually crosses all of our, a number of our, our offices internationally. Um, but I don't know if you would feel that you would be a dis at a disadvantage if you hadn't had experience in that. Uh, that would be my kind of personal view on it um, as a trainee. I think you would just get involved in things once you're here with us. Yeah. Um, we've got a question here that I think we get quite often for the trainees. What's the work-life balance like as a yeah. trainee? <laughs> You're gonna be brave enough to take that one, anyone? I think um, it's fair, if I'm honest, it's a fans fair in its approach. So we work at a, like a demanding law firm that expects the best of us. And that's understandable. That's something that I signed up for. But I also think that the teams are understanding. So if you have a specific like event that you want to go to, if you communicate it um, with your team that you, like, you would like the evening off, if there's a particular, if it's because you're in a particularly busy part of a deal cycle, the team will more often than not really work to try and um, support you and enable you to do that. So I think, yes, you do have to work hard, but also the team the team and the firm more generally recognise the fact that we all need time off, we all need time to socialise and we all have other priorities in our lives. And I think it does the best it can to balance the work demands and the demands of the other aspects of our lives. Yeah. I'd also just add to Freddie's point that I think in general, the work-life balance is pretty good. Um, and especially, you know, there will be times when the deal cycle or the filing deadline means that you have to stay up and work, work late. But partners and associates are really, really keen that if there's no work um, on a particular day and you're kind of twiddling your thumbs at five, or 5.30 or 6, you know, they'll say, go home, you don't need to be here. Mm -hmm. So there are kind of massive fluctuations sometimes. Um, and in the downtime, you are more than um, more than permitted to go and head to the pub at 5. <laughs> Although yeah, not at the moment. The pub. I know. <laughs> so sad. Um, just a couple of questions that are a bit more recruitment based, but just to make sure we answer them. So in terms of 
first year Insight Day, our application is considered on a rolling basis. Yes, and it's the same for our um, general open day in December, but we, we still have um, plenty of spots um, available, so don't be deterred from applying. Um, equally, um, in terms of um, applying for the open day, and then if you are unsuccessful, don't, that doesn't mean that you uh, can't apply for the vacation scheme. There's only a certain number of spaces on the open day. Um, we've had plenty of trainees, um, and I'm sure that maybe people, well, I can't remember if all of you went to the open day, but we've had plenty of people who haven't gone to the open day that have made it through our recruitment process. So it's, um, yeah, just don't, don't see it as a negative. Um, we've got a question here. How does your international arbitration practice make you stand out from the competition? I mean, I'm naturally thinking, Hannah, you might have some thoughts on that. But I mean, the, the one thing that springs to mind immediately is just Penny Madden, um, QC. So she's one of the, I mean, she's a pretty phenomenal woman um, and, and a phenomenal um, advocate and was is, is quite unusual, um, well, fairly unusual for a solicitor to, to be, be made a QC in this way. Um, but I don't know what it was like to, to work with her, Hannah, if you have any thoughts on that. And I'll keep looking through the question yeah, sure. um one thing i really noticed um which probably having listened to us you'll be unsurprised to hear but working with our sort of on, with the other sides during arbitrations is how much bigger often their teams were yeah. that's a huge point of difference so um law firms that are our sort of competitors um would naturally have sort of 10 teams of maybe 10 15 or even bigger um whereas we might be working on an arbitration as a team of maybe three four five six um, so that sort of hopefully reflects sort of this, the sort of real skill at the top end of the sort of, as Katie was saying, our, our very sort of um, renowned partners, but also carrying through to the sort of the senior associates and the junior associates that people take on a huge amount of responsibility and um, have the ability to be able to manage such sort of um, huge kind of high, high um High, high value arbitrations with, with smaller teams um, and as I said earlier we there's really sort of no arbitration that we we I don't think we wouldn't work on we um, are very very well known in the commercial arbitration sphere, sphere but also increasingly um, well known for investor state arbitration work so um, we really do kind of straddle both um, and are equally impressive on both fronts. Thanks Hannah. Um, Ro, shout if there's any questions that you want to raise. I mean, I've just seen that there's a there's a number about um, you know the application process. I know we've already talked about that, but how best to prepare for it. I mean, when you it, was there anything in particular that you did, you know, thinking of, in terms of your your research. I mean, I think that research is just absolutely key to to making your application stand out. Um, are there any tips that you might have um, for the candidates kind of making their applications now? Like what was the process you went through? Did you, you know, focus on a few applications? Did you, you know, put out 50? You know, what, what and where were your, the key areas that you, you know, you, how did you keep abreast of, of commercial um, goings on? How did you remain commercially aware? So I kind of started off with the scattergun approach. When I was first looking at law yeah. firms, I sent off like, I missed 30 winter vacation scheme applications and they were like universally rejected because they were terrible and I pretty much just copied and pasted the name of the law firms in there. So by the time I came to applying to like summer vacation schemes and training contracts, I think I only applied to like four or five for each of them. And I you know, made sure that I went to their open days and I'd met them at, at law fairs and I really focused on tailoring it to them. So I had like a little Word document with research on every single firm I was applying to. And then I made sure that every fresh application I started from scratch and tried to really think about why that particular firm, why I was applying to them. Um, and then that started to get me more success than the scatter kind of approach personally. Yeah. <laughs> Did anybody else have a different approach to Sarah? I think one of my biggest tips, I, I had a sort of similar approach. I don't think I was quite as scattergun. Um, I think I applied to 10 or so different firms. Um, but I think one tip would be don't apply to the firm that you really, really want to work at first, yeah. because inevitably your first application will be 
a bit messy, a bit ill thought out. Um, and as you go through more and more uh, drafts and more and more applications, you kind of whittle down what you want to say and you become much more succinct and um, articulate in what you're saying. And I think that would be my number one tip. Yeah, that's so true, Harry. And I think it's the same of interviews because you just get better at interviews, don't you? Like the first one's always slightly, slightly traumatic, but they get better. Um, okay, so there's a, there's a good question here from um, Maya. Um, so question for all. So what are the most rewarding and ch challenging aspects of your job? Um, does anyone want to take that first? The rewarding bit's easy. <laughs> I think the I think the rewarding and challenging can be two sides of the same coin because I think often the most challenging things that you do when you come out the other side become the most rewarding things. Um, so for me, it's been you know some really difficult piece of research or a really difficult deal that has lasted weeks and weeks and weeks, and actually getting out the other side you think wow I've learned so much mm. and I've come so far um, and I really feel like I've achieved so much um, and got some real recognition for that as well so I think yeah they're, they're both the most challenging things and the, and the most rewarding as well. Yeah that's so true um, I think that's right um, if, does anybody else have anything they want to add just and I'll have a quick scan through the questions um we're being asked whether interviews are online um they will be um for the foreseeable but um i i, I wouldn't worry about them i think um i don't know if you guys have found you've got used to the online environment quite well over the past few months um, um we've got one from somebody here asking is there anything that surprised you all about working at a law firm I've been really surprised at kind of the breadth of work I've been in, involved in already and not just I mean I was obviously expecting a breadth of work on the corporate side of things but I've been really surprised at the kind of pro bono work that I've gotten involved with um like one of the things that I did in the first few weeks is the firm was drafting a memo on Black Lives Matter and the militarization of the police in the US so one of the things I did was I went and researched all this stuff for this memo and I was like I would never have thought that I'd be doing work on Black Lives Matter at a commercial law firm, but it's something that I've, I've done and I've really enjoyed. Um, you know, and likewise, I've been doing some pro bono matters with like um, immigration cases in the US and the one I'm doing at the moment, we're working with a small counseling uh, charity in the UK. So just so many different things that I'm getting to experience that kind of are outside of what you might traditionally think of as corporate law. Thanks, Sarah. Um, um, we've got one here from Tamana. How does the firm distinguish itself from its competitors, um, firms such as Gadden, K&E, since they share clients in similar industries? That, um, I think one thing that Katie sort of alluded to at the beginning is that we're quite unique for a US firm in that we're sort of really equally strong in both our kind of transactional and our disputes practice so a lot of US firms are sort of generally often more renowned for their transactional um, practices and for their deals but um, we really sort of if others disagree but pretty much 50-50 firm and really pride ourselves on sort of strength, strength and depth in both so as Casey said before as well you know if, if you don't know what sort of lawyer you want to be and you want to have sort of real high-end experience of both um, I think Gibson Dunn can offer that some often in a way that a lot of other firms can't. Um, and another point, you know, I think we've all talked about it, but I think um, some law, some US law firms and competitor law firms do sort of um, have um, people sort of um, not necessarily think that they're as welcoming or as friendly or as open door. Um, I, I know amongst us, we've all sort of had experiences at other firms in, in vacation schemes and with friends. Um, there and we can only speak Gibson Dunn, but it is a genuinely kind of collaborative and friendly environment in in a way that as I'm sure you'll all experience as you sort of start your careers and, and meet different firms, um, not, not all firms are. Um, and I think we're unique in the kind of um, US firm sphere of sort of having the, the breadth and depth and the kind of um, really welcoming environment. Yeah. 
Thanks, Anna. I think that's spot on. Okay, so Nicholas would like to know what a successful day looks like for you. Oh, wow, they must be very varied amongst you. <laughs> Does anybody want to take that one? I think, Katie, you hit the nail on the head. They're very varied amongst us, um, but they're probably also very varied for each of us day by day. Um, I think for me, a successful day is working on a variety of different matters and kind of feeling like I'm getting somewhere with um, with each of them. I am currently working on probably 15 different matters, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, which does feel quite a lot, but um, you know, being able to kind of progress each of them along um, definitely feels like a successful day. But then the flip side of that is if you spend, um, you know, if you do something really cool in your day, that also feels like a successful day. So on Friday, I worked um, with a partner. It was just me and her working together on a pitch, which we then pitched in the afternoon to a client. Um, and we were talking about modern slavery legislation in the EU um, at the UN level and at the UK level. Um, and I kind of, I'd spent a lot of the week working on that pitch. Um, and that also felt like a really successful day because we pitched to the client. The client was, you know, really um, engaged throughout the discussion and really enjoyed it and has invited us back. Um, so yeah, it's, it really varies and it's quite hard to pinpoint what a successful day looks like, but I hope I've answered your question in that. Thanks, Harriet. That sounds like a pretty successful day to me. <laughs> <laughs> um, right, are there any other questions um, that you want to kind of draw out from the, the chat? I'm conscious, I'm sorry that we haven't been able to answer all of them. We've got a few more minutes um, left. If people are still happy to, to stay and join us. Yeah, I think we've, we've got a few questions that are along the same line. So I've kind of tried to broadly have those answered. Um, we've got a question here about um, top tips for standing out in the vacation scheme yeah that's a good that is a good question um so standing out on the vacation scheme itself as opposed to um as opposed to the application process yeah that it is it is i think more difficult um and more challenging in the virtual environment and we were really conscious of that we thought very carefully about it when we planned the scheme um i think Though my advice remains the same as it would when you're there in person, and there are, you know, there are there are certain so there are certain things you can do. So so, um, and this will apply to any other vacation schemes that you know you might attend, or um, you know, kind of mini mini schemes that you might attend. You, I think, um, you will. Yeah. Oh, you will receive um, um, a review from your supervisor. So on our scheme and a number, a number of other vacation schemes, you'll be looked after by a supervisor. It, for us, you spend half of your time in a transactional kind of area and half of the time in a disputes area. And we do that so that it almost reflects as closely as possible in such a small space of time what it would be like as a trainee. But you will, so, so every piece of work you do for that supervisor, you just, you know, it, it has to be, you know, it's, it's a commitment to excellence, basically. Um, and that's what we look for in our trainees. So every single piece of work you do, just try and go the extra mile, just show that you're inquisitive, ask lots of questions um, of your supervisors. And there's, no, there's never a stupid question. There's never a silly question. It's, you know, so that you want to understand you know, how your task fits into the broader matter. Um, because your supervisor will write a review for you. And that is, is really one of the most important bits of information we're going to have about you as a, as a vacation scheme student. I would, um, and this is harder, but we normally encourage people to, to kind of reach out to, um, to, to, to lawyers within the firm and kind of ask them about the areas that they're working in. And, you know, and if you, so it's almost like our free, you know, like our free market system. People were still doing it though. They did it really successfully on the virtual scheme, didn't they, Ro? I mean, it's, it is a bit more intimidating kind of asking someone to set up a Zoom call for a virtual coffee, but you can, people have got more used to it and you just have to kind of embrace it. And, and the, 
the, the overwhelming response from the lawyers in the firm, they absolutely love the vacation scheme because we do one a year. So everyone's excited about it happening. But they they really love getting to know the vacation scheme students and hearing about you know what's drawn you to the firm and and actually they like talking about what they do so they'll you know they like talking about their day their work um, so the amount of um, conversations that you know partners were taking hours out of their day I mean one of our partners in particular Selena who heads our um, diversity efforts and she. I mean, I actually sent her flowers at the end of the vacation scheme because she spent hours and hours talking to individuals, you know, just um, by themselves, so not even as, as a group, just about, you know, whatever their questions were. Um, and I, I think, I mean, I don't know if you guys had the same experience when you're on the vacation scheme in person, but people are so generous with their time. Um, so, but that helps you stand out, you know, you know ask, ask questions. Um, and we do, we run... Um, two or three um, written assessments and that we, we you have to hand those in so obviously you've just got to make sure that those are um, of as, as good a standard as you can possibly um, kind of manage and it's a busy few weeks so you've got to kind of spin a few plates at the same time but again that's going to be a piece of data um, that you know that's graded and, and that you're going to be compared to your to you know to the other people on the scheme so you're going to do yourself a favour if you, you know, you get get strong grades, I guess, for want of a better description there, um, because then when we're looking at all of the information as a whole, you know, it's such small margins because everybody is is excellent. So it's just pushing yourself slightly up. And if you've got, you know, if you're excellent in all of these, then you're going to be part of that group of trainees that, um, you know, we make offers to. But um, I mean, I don't know, do, do any of you have tips from the vacation scheme that, that you thought helps that you know make you stand out at all so like one of the sorry so no, one of the things okay, um one of the things that i did was i kept well, not a diary but basically a diary and i listed at the end of every single day like what i'd done and what i've learned which meant that when it came to like you know talk, doing your exit interview and talking to graduate recruitment they asked yeah. you what have you worked on that you really enjoyed you can look back and you know exactly what to say um, it also that's such a found... good idea, Sarah. I've never heard someone mention that before. It's such a good idea. I'm going to tell people to do that. <laughs> <laughs> I've, I've heard it useful. Oh, I've still got it somewhere. <laughs> um, and then the other thing, which I think is challenging, but is try not to compare yourself to the other vacation mm. schemers and take every day one day at a time. I think when you really want to get a training contract, it can be really overwhelming to think about three weeks, how am I going to smash it? Like, oh God, you know, all these people speak another language or they went to a better university than me or... And actually, you'll do best if you just focus on that one day, doing as best as you can and ignoring everyone else. And then the next day, best as you can. And um, yeah. by the end of the three weeks, hopefully you've performed your best. Yeah, I think that's uh, Yeah. And actually, people tend to become, form really strong friendships on the vacation scheme. So we, by the nature of the type of people we look for, yeah, I, I think that, that people aren't overly competitive. But it is hard, isn't it? Because you know you're competing. But yeah, I think that's very good advice, Sarah. Thank you. I'm conscious of time, Rose. Right. Is there yeah, any other I think questions that you wanted to draw out? So maybe one or two more, and then I think we're at the end. Yeah, I think we've got one more that we get quite often, so it might be helpful for you to, to answer. Um, the man is asking how exactly the free market system operates whilst mm. also being assigned a specific training seat. Yeah, that's um, a very good question. Um, just from my perspective from graduate recruitment's perspective and then i'll hand over to anybody else who wants to kind of talk about it from your point of view um we it it, it can't operate in its full capacity when you're a trainee um and it would be wrong of me to say that it does because you are um you know you, you're allocated to a particular department and, and a supervisor in saying that the way that um gibbs and dunn works is that you know when you're sat in you know a, a dispute seat, you might happen to be sat with a, um, a supervisor who tends to focus a little bit more on say international arbitration. So that's you know Hannah did a seat there, um, but you are very much um, available and encouraged um, and able to get involved with all, all of the work across the disputes team. You know when. Uh, 
although you might work a lot for your supervisor, but you are very much free to do that. Um, and, and indeed, if you're quiet, um, there's no reason that you, you wouldn't then pick up work that's outside of the disputes practice. But it's um, but the spirit of the free market system is very much respected in a number of ways, and we bear it in mind. And an example of that is, um, you know, when when we're thinking about tra allocating trainee seats, as much as possible, we will we will put um, trainees where they want to go. It can't always work because it's a bit of a jigsaw of putting everyone into different seats. Um, but if, for example, someone didn't get their seat before, we will do absolutely everything we can to, get, to guarantee that person has their next op seat option. And and that's and I've had many conversations where, you know, somebody would ideally like a trainee to go to a particular team, but we've you know we push back and say, well, no, because you know the four, you know the most important point you know, we have to think about the business need but the most important point is that we want to try and and meet the trainees kind of preferences as well so it's in that respect it, it's we give a lot of weight to it um so i hope that answers the question i mean have you guys had any do you feel that the the free market system in any way operates for you as a as a trainee I think perhaps in the context of pro bono, it does operate yeah. more fully. So for instance, I'm sat in corporate real estate, but I'm getting involved with a pro bono project, which is in dispute right. to do with LGBT rights in yeah. developing world countries. Um, that's so far away from my day-to-day -day, um, like business client work, but nonetheless, like the free market system enables me to reach out to partners and associates across the firm to find work in a pro bono context that I can get involved with. Yeah, that, thank you, Freddie. That's that's an ideal example. It probably, it probably operates fully, doesn't it, as a, you know, in the pro bono world. Um, yeah. Um, thank you. Was there anything else? I'm just conscious that we're 129. Um, if there is, uh, I think we might have to draw matters to a close, um, unless there was a burning question, Ray, that you can see that we haven't answered. I'm sorry if we haven't, if we've missed any, um, the number have come in, but we've, any row, otherwise I will wrap things up. I think we've covered them best we can yeah. broadly. Obviously, if there's, if there's anything specific that people really want to ask, they can contact us at the graduate recruitment email address. We're happy to speak to anybody. Yeah, thank you. Um, I'm also happy um, if anybody wants to contact me on LinkedIn, I'm more than happy to, um, to take time to answer any questions that haven't been answered today um, and as Ray mentioned we've got the graduate recruitment at gibsondunn.com address which you can email us out there and we will come back to you but thank you so much um, I hope that you've enjoyed um, today's webinar we've um, certainly enjoyed um, kind of being here and answering your questions um, thank you to our trainee panel and to Rowena um, for handling and fielding the questions um, and we'll we'll see you again soon hopefully at some point and we look forward to receiving your application okay thank you very much bye